Hello, welcome to BIO 102 New Testament Survey. This is Dr. Bart B. Bruhler. This lecture is entitled Luke and Acts, Structure and Message. Let's begin with our lecture plan. We will begin this lecture by examining the structure of Luke and the structure of Acts and a key opening passage in each. We're going to get an overview of each of these major books and look at a crucial passage that occurs at the beginning of each book that is indicative, if indicative of its themes and contents. Then we will survey some major theological themes found in these two volumes. As you probably already know, these two books were written by the same author, whom we typically call Luke, and they really are properly two volumes of one larger work. The introduction of Acts makes that very clear to us. You'll see pictured there below uh, two scenes from the city of Ephesus. Here we have the amphitheater in the city, very large, probably could see 30,000 people. And you'll see the, all the seating selected up in there in a very large, long street stretching all the way down to it. Here we have the Library of Celsus, which you can see is a very imposing edifice, which contained a very large library in Ephesus as well. Luke was very familiar with the city of Ephesus and had Paul stationed there for a long time in one of his missionary journeys. Let's begin with our lecture now. First of all, why Luke and Acts, or why Luke hyphen Acts? Well, we take a look at these together because it is the largest and broadest theological narrative in the New Testament. Even though these two books are separated in our Bibles by the Gospel of John, really they belong together. This is one continuous story that stretches from the beginnings of the ministry of Jesus through the ministry of the early church after Jesus' resurrection. So you'll often hear me refer to these as Luke Acts, uh, two volumes of one larger work. Also, this is my favorite part of the New Testament. This is what I've done the most of my research on in my academic work, and so it's one of my favorites. I love this book very, very much. Let's take a look at the prologue to Luke to get an idea of what this two-volume work is to, supposed to be all about. I'll just read this for us. Luke begins by saying, since many have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided, after investigating everything carefully from the very first, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed." A few key pieces to this prologue give us insight into the nature of this two-volume work of Luke Acts. First, we should note that this is a formal literary prologue. Luke's Gospel and Acts are different than the roughness of Mark's Gospel. Luke writes in a more refined literary style. He shows the ability to switch styles in appropriate times and venues between Jewish settings and more Hellenistic settings. And this prologue befits an official uh, formal literary work dedicated to a patron who has helped pay for it, in this case probably Theophilus. It bespeaks of Luke's education and perhaps his social class as well. You'll notice that in the prologue, Luke explicitly refers to his work being based on previous written sources and on eyewitness traditions. He says that others have taken the time to write this down, and that he investigated it all and referred to those who had been eyewitnesses from the beginning. This was a broad investigative task that Luke takes seriously and grounds his entire two-volume work on it. One key thing that you need to catch here the term orderly in the prologue, Luke says he aimed to write an orderly account, does not mean chronological, but explanatory. This is orderly not so much in the sequence of events, but in terms of the meaning or organization of events that will make them clearer to the reader. Luke uses this term one other time in Acts, where the story is all out of sequence and order, but it is changed in order to make the purpose of the story clearer, and that's probably what Luke is referring to in his prologue as well. It's not history, although it contains history, it's more about Luke's theological and evangelistic message. <laughs> 
Next, we'll note that the recipient of this book, Theophilus, is most excellent, uh, a term that Luke again uses in Acts to refer to kings and governors over the province of Judea. This probably indicates the fact that Theophilus, probably a real person, maybe symbolic, is indicated as being a high class, perhaps even a political official in the Roman system. Next, Luke explicitly tells us his purpose in this prologue. It is to provide greater certainty to those who already know the gospel to some degree. Luke does not write to Theophilus as one who is ignorant of the Christian tradition, but rather of one who has heard these stories before, participated in Christian worship perhaps, but he writes this to confirm and grant greater certainty to those who have already been instructed in the basics of the Christian faith. Let's take a look at the structure of Luke. Luke's structure is actually quite simple and basic. We have, after the prologue, from 1.5 to 4.13, births and beginnings. The Gospel of Luke features an interesting interchange between John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus throughout the beginning that sets the stage for the rest of the Gospel. Then we have the rest of the Gospel, from 4.14 to 24.53, which we might label very broadly as the public ministry of Jesus. This breaks down into three sections. The first is in Galilee. A uh, relatively short section modeled largely on the Gospel of Mark from 4.14 to 9.50. In the next section, Jesus is on the road. Notice this very long section, ten chapters long. It takes Jesus to get from his declaration that he is going to Jerusalem in chapter 9 to actually arrive in Jerusalem quite a bit later. This is Luke's special section, sometimes called the travel narrative, where we most clearly see his hand in editing and adding his own unique material to the gospel tradition. Finally, we have the Passion in Jerusalem, again, sharing a lot of material in Mark with a few pieces added on by Luke as well. Let's take a look now at a key passage in Luke. This is Luke 4, 16 through 19. You'll notice that this passage comes right at the very beginning of that second large section in Luke's Gospel of Jesus' public ministry. In this case, Jesus has just returned from his temptation in the desert, and he goes directly to a synagogue in Jerusalem, where he has been brought up. And here, in the synagogue, he begins to quote scripture and preach on it. We'll read starting in verse 16. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Let's take a look at a few parts of this introductory passage in Luke. Luke has specifically placed this here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in order to emphasize some key themes that will continue on throughout the rest of the Gospel. The first point that we ought to, to call attention to is that Jesus' ministry is empowered by the Spirit. We see that right at the beginning of the quotation from Isaiah in verse 18. It's also mentioned just before this passage in 4.14 as well. And Jesus speaks about this again, that he is anointed by the Spirit of God to cast out demons in 11.20 as well. Luke is very interested in the role of the Holy Spirit, not only in the Gospel and in Jesus' life, but also in Acts as well. Next, we'll notice that Luke, like the other Gospels, characterizes, his, characterizes Jesus' message as the proclamation of good news. And Jesus refers to this as well at the end of chapter 4, that he was sent by God to proclaim good news. Well, what is that good news exactly? Part of the good news is the people to whom it is directed, in this case, to the poor primarily. Another point that Jesus brings up again in chapter 7 and again in chapter 16, Jesus believes that this is good news because it is good news to the poor, to those in poverty. 
Next, it's also good news because it proclaims freedom for prisoners. We don't see this too much in the Gospel of Luke, but when we look to Acts, we see that both Peter and Paul were released from prison, very literally, and that Paul also preaches about being freed from all the things that the Law of Moses could not free us from, again, using the symbolism of being a prisoner. There is also sight for the blind, which is fulfilled with the healing of the blind man in chapter 18. And then release for the oppressed, uh, from a story that you're now familiar with in Luke chapter 13, the healing of the crippled woman. If you read that story carefully, you'll notice that Jesus uses the same word there, that he frees this woman who has been oppressed by Satan for many years. The language of oppression here in this beginning uh, section of Luke's Gospel indicates satanic or demonic oppression, which Jesus frees people from. Finally, and climactically, the proclamation of good news is to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It is about grace being extended to all. We might pick up a famous story in chapter 14 where the master of the house throws a grand banquet and wants everyone to be brought in to that banquet. Jesus is here to proclaim that year of God's favor, that year of grace. Moving on to Acts. I want to point out that Acts 1.8 plays a key role in the structure of Acts. We're going to be talking about this in your discussion board. And I want you to think about the role of geography and crucial events for the discussion board on the structure of Acts. As a little bit of clue, we'll take a picture, uh, take a hint from that picture right above, which is a modern representation of the story of Pentecost. You might think about how major events like the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost play a role in the structure of Luke's uh, second volume, Acts. Let's take a look at a key passage in Acts. This is Acts 1, 6 through 8. Again, near the beginning of the book, it indicates some key things for us. So when they had all come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What we get in the book of Acts might be described as the ongoing acts of God in the eschatological pause between the ascension of Jesus, which is narrated at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts, and the return of Jesus. We often think of Acts as the Acts of the Apostles, and indeed that is its ancient title, but in many ways it's Luke's continuing story from the Gospel of the ongoing acts of God on behalf of humanity for their salvation. Notice that Jesus indicates that his disciples will be empowered by the Spirit, just as Jesus was. They carry out their mission on behalf of God in the same power that Jesus carried out his mission on behalf of God through the power of the Spirit. Next, and your translations might vary on this, but I think it's best to say that they will be witnesses to Jesus. Some translations say, my witnesses, as if they belong to Jesus. But more and more in Acts, what we get are sermons and proclamations and miracles and signs that bear witness to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah chosen and raised by God. Therefore, they bear their witness to the person and identity of Jesus in God's plan of salvation. Finally, to give you a little bit of a hint here, Acts 1.8 gives us a clue to the structure of Acts based on geography. It mentions Jerusalem which covers Acts chapters 1 through 7. The transitional area of Judea and Samaria spinning out from Jerusalem, which Acts discusses in chapters 8 through 15, and then opens the floodgates to the ends of the earth, which covers Acts chapters 16 through 28. Now that we've looked at the structure of these two books and a key passage that's indicative of them, let's step back and look at some major themes that stretch across Luke-Acts. The first would be reversals. Luke is very interested in how God's grace reverses things from what we might initially expect. 
This shows up very powerfully right near the beginning of Luke's gospel in Mary's song in Luke 1, 46 through 55, where Mary famously declares that God will bring down the powerful and lift up the lowly. It's this type of reversal that is happening in the proclamation of God's kingdom. Acts 16:16 16, 16 through 33, the famous story about the Philippian jailer illustrates this as well. Notice the reversal that happens. At the beginning of the story, Paul is a prisoner in jail and shackles, and there is a guard, a jailer, over charge of him. By the end of the story, the guard is treating Paul as a messenger of God and receives the gospel. Paul is no longer a, pa- uh, a prisoner, but now a patron. A really radical reversal in that story. Another theme very prominent in Luke and Acts is the interlocking theme of poverty and wealth. We see this in Luke's versions of the Beatitudes, which are quite different from Matthew's in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26, where in parallel structure, Luke has Jesus first say, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But on the flip side, Woe to you who are rich. Luke intertwines these themes of poverty and wealth. Similarly, in near the beginning of Acts, in chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, we see Luke illustrating the type of generosity that overtook the early church. Anyone who was in need brought their needs to the church, and those who had goods and possessions and land sold them in order to support those in the community who were in need. Luke sees this as an ideal expression of Christian generosity. We've already talked about the Holy Spirit in both of the key passages that we examined for Luke and Acts, but I wanted to bring it up here again as one of the major themes of the two books, stretches all the way across this two-volume work. Next, we might talk about continuity and unity. Luke is very interested in seeing how this story between Jesus and the church connects. We can trace a very clear line of leadership from beginning with Jesus Jesus transfers leadership to Peter, and Peter later passes that baton on to Paul. There are very, uh, a number of similarities between these three figures. They all heal blind people. They all go on great journeys. Luke is interested in this kind of continuity to show that Jesus' message is co- consistent with Peter's and Paul's message. We could also look at Acts 15, 22 through 29. In Acts 15, Luke is dealing with the issue of how do Gentiles become believers in Christ. And he emphasizes several times in this chapter that the entire church gathered and made a unanimous, consensual decision about this key issue, emphasizing the unity of the church. Luke is very interested in the worldwide mission of God. Again, early in Luke's Gospel in the infancy narratives, chapter 2, verses 29 and 32, in what's known as Simeon's song, Simeon talks about salvation being displayed for all people, a salvation that will be light for the Gentiles and glory for Israel. It encompasses both of these groups of people altogether. Later in Acts, Peter is the first person to preach to a Gentile convert known and named Cornelius. And Peter concludes that because God gave him the Holy Spirit, God must have opened the doors of salvation to the Gentiles as well. And our last theme is that of salvation. If we want to pick one key term to cover Luke and Acts that captures Luke's idea of what it is that the kingdom is about and what Jesus and the early church are doing, salvation is probably the best thing we've got. A great story in chapter 19 of Luke, many of you know it, the story of Zacchaeus. In this passage, Jesus says that he has come to seek and save the lost, and that salvation has come to the house of Zacchaeus. Later in Acts 4, 8 through 12, uh, Peter says that salvation is found in no one else except Jesus Christ. It's this term of salvation and all that is wrapped up with it in the ministry and message of Jesus in the early church that captures what God is doing through both of them. I hope these themes tie together these two books for you and you have a better understanding of them at this point. Look forward to discussing that for, uh, further with you online. Thank you.